Good evening and welcome back to Harvard Hillel. Nearly three months ago, our lives were upturned by this pandemic. And we launched this series in response as a way of addressing some of the most important questions that coronavirus posed. Some of those have to do with medical ethics and healthcare policy. And it would be hard to find someone more equipped to help us think through those questions than tonight's guest, Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel. Tonight's uh, session will focus on those questions. But before we begin, I did just wanna take a moment to acknowledge the gravity of the situation in which we find ourselves this evening. Uh, as we have all striven not to become infected by coronavirus, it is hard not to be affected by the horrific video of the murder of George Floyd, those who stood idly by, and of the subsequent chaos which has engulfed so many of the cities in which we live. In response, this evening, I'd like to just offer a short and humble prayer. I don't have my Sidor with me, but um, I'm paraphrasing from the text of the prayer for the welfare of the United States government, which says and asks of God, who is king of all kings, to grant wisdom to those who are officials and counselors, uh, counselors of our government, and to all people, you and me alike, that we can know and learn and proceed carefully and with wisdom through this murky situation, and that we can all be kinder and gentle, gentler to each and every person that we encounter. Uh, I would now like to introduce our speaker this evening. Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel is Vice Provost of, for Global Initiatives and Chair of the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy at the University of Pennsylvania. He has served as Special Advisor for Health Policy to the Director of the White House Office of Management and Budget and was Chair of the Department of Bioethics at the Clinical Center of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, of health. Uh, he is a oncologist by training. Uh, he received his MD and PhD in political philosophy from Harvard University and has served on faculty at a number of the nation's top medical schools. He was also a visiting professor at NYU Law School. Dr. Emanuel has written and edited nine books and over 200 scientific articles. He is currently a columnist for the New York Times. Uh, Zeke, it's a pleasure to meet you. I don't think we've ever met uh, in person. I've heard you speak a number of times and read a lot of your writings, uh, which have certainly helped me think through a lot of ideas over the years. Uh, I think it is well known that you and your brothers uh, occupy a certain mystique in American culture, um, but I don't know if people are yet familiar with a growing mystique of the Emanuel sisters, uh, your three daughters, Rebecca, Gabrielle, and our uh, interviewer tonight, uh, Natalia Emanuel. Uh, Natalia is a PhD candidate here at Harvard in economics and an active member of the Cambridge Jewish community. Her research focuses on women in the workforce, the wages for blue collar workers and criminal justice policy. Natalia, I don't know if you remember the first time we met, I was actually interviewing for my current job at Harvard Hillel and I spoke about criminal justice. And afterwards you came over, we had a long conversation and you shared with me uh, C.S. Lewis's article, The Humanitarian Theory of Punishment, which has been an article I revisited uh, over time and certainly occupies uh, in my own mind uh, an important voice in thinking about criminal justice. This is a pleasure to have you with us this evening. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Zeke and Natalia for you to turn on your videos. And uh, without further ado, uh, Dr. Emanuel uh, and Natalia Emanuel. You control the video. Uh, you sh I think you're invited to turn on the video. It says you can't start your video because the host has stopped it. So I don't know who the host is, but it ain't me. All right, we'll get this sorted out. One moment, please. All right, you're both, there you go, great. All right. Sorry about that, please go ahead, Natalia. just reached the uh, 100,000th death from COVID. Um, one of the things that we've seen in the data is uh, that the number of cases in the U.S. has actually plateaued rather than dipping downward. And so I wanted to um, get your sense about what this means for us on a day-to-day -day level and for us as a country. 
Well, on a day-to-day -day level, I think the uh, three or four most important things I can say is uh, closed spaces, uh, crowds uh, for extended period of time. That's the transmission. That's how tr the virus transmits. So being in a closed space in the room with other people in a classroom or airplane, uh, large crowds, uh, and extended period of time that allows the virus to go back and forth as people breathe out. That's the first thing. So those are the three big issues um, and uh, how the virus transmits. Uh, and we have seen those in a lot of the super spread cases. Someone, you know, the Biogen people get together in Cambridge and they talk at a meeting for a long time in the same room. Second, uh, sneezing coughing, singing, and yelling spreads. A, you reach down deep into your lungs, bring up and spread a lot. Um, and that's uh, very, uh, got a great documented cases of a lot of that happening. Um, so you've got to protect yourself from people who are likely to sneeze, cough, sing, uh, or scream. Uh, so uh, that also is important. Uh, the data on the fat face masks, um, not great, but what's the harm? What's the cost? Uh, and they probably do work to some degree. Uh, so you should always wear it, wear a face mask when you're going, uh, walking outside. If you're doing things like running for exercise or biking and you're not gonna be any, near anyone for except seconds probably doesn't make a difference, although you should probably carry it in case there's a disaster, you have to help someone. I can't tell you the number of times I've been out running or something, someone falls and needs attention or someone, uh, I had someone had a, di a diabetic hypoglycemic episode and I need to, to attend to them. So you should have that mask readily available in case some emergency is necessary. Um, why haven't we seen it come down? We're not mm -hmm. very good. We're not very disciplined at adhering to the uh, physical distancing requirements uh, and we're violating them. And, and you can see that, you know, uh, on a sort of happy note, if you look at the crowds at uh, the uh, Kennedy Space State uh, Center at liftoff, okay, lots of people crammed together, no masks. You look at protests, lots of people crammed together. They might have masks, they might not have masks. Most of the police haven't had masks that I've seen them. We're gonna, even if it's outdoors, we're still, you know, you're gonna be screaming at each other. You're exchanging a lot of virus if someone happens to be sick. Um, we can't control ourselves, so we're opening up, you know, stores, restaurants, and other things where this could happen. Not a good situation. So that's why we're not coming down. We are coming down in some isolated places, by the way, New York, and uh, and uh, New Jersey doing very well because um, they've been serious. Do you foresee a way to it. open up that space? Um, I think actually the summer is great. So I just got off the call a call I don't know two hours ago with a theater nonprofit, very progressive theater group in New Jersey, and I said, you know, outdoor performances, draw circles, keep people you know, separated outdoor performances should be fine. As long as you make sure there's no congestion at the bathroom, no congestion at the, at the uh, 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 stands, uh, the food stands, and when people come into the park. I was disappointed, frankly disappointed, that um, uh, Tanglewood, Wolf Trap, and those kind of places uh, actually canceled because they're outdoor venues. You can actually keep the number of people down um, and you can have, entertainment. And I think it's important. I think, you know, one of the reasons I was talking to this arts group is I think it's really important to have cultural entertainment, especially at this moment, when we have so much uproar in our society. You know, one of the key things I think for making us reflect about what we want is, you know, culture, whether it's drama that I prefer or concerts that other people prefer that have uh, very relevant music, do not have religious services indoors for an extended period of time when you're chanting that's a, like that that's a disaster don't do that so right. I, I could say sure. our president got it asked backwards but i will refrain from political remarks for just the moment so we've seen that COVID has been 
disproportionately impacting people of color and communities that are already disadvantaged. Why do you think that is? Like, do you think this is because they are more likely to be exposed because they have maybe higher rates of comorbidity? They're less likely to seek out or receive top-notch care? I don't think, think it's the latter. I don't think it's the latter, um, although that is true. <laughs> Um, I do think that they probably, for all sorted reasons, um, have delayed going to healthcare services. I think they can get top-notch care, but I, I think they've delayed, and that probably does have an effect. So one is the underlying uh, comorbidities in the community, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, all higher in uh, certainly the African-American uh, community, uh, the living in quarters that are tight and multi-generational, so much more exposure uh, probably contributes. Um, and, uh, you know, the distrust of the system and therefore probably not adhering to advice given by the healthcare uh, and public health systems as, you know, uh, inconsistent as that has been given the, uh, 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 you know, present and other people's uh, messages. Um, has led probably uh, all of them combined uh, led to a disproportionate rate. And it's, I mean, it's pretty dramatic here in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. It's uh, between 45 and 48% of the city is African-American and the mortality rate had been hovering at 80% being African-American. It's now down to a whopping 75%. So you can see it's an enormous uh, disproportionate increase in uh, both cases and mortality. And do you think there's any way to address this inequality? Well, I, I, I don't think there's a way to address the inequality in the short period in which we're looking at COVID. You have to address the underlying larger uh, issues, um, which require addressing socioeconomic issues, trust in our society, which is obviously at a low point here, um, and uh, the underlying eating patterns, physical exercise, uh, and then uh, uh, more difficult than all of that is the housing patterns uh, of the community. Um, but, you know, th those are the kind of factors that are absolutely important to decreasing the comorbidity rate, increasing the health outcomes. Um, and it's not going to be done in the space of, you know, call it 12 to 18 months during COVID, but it's something that we have to be dedicated to. Well, I think one other potential piece here is that, um, Many disadvantaged communities have members who are frontline workers. Um, is there some way we can sort of address their additional exposure? Well, when we get a, vi a vaccine, we certainly, uh, I think, you know, uh, physicians, nurses, frontline healthcare workers, but other frontline workers and first responders are going to have to be at the top of the list for the distribution of those vaccines. Um, that would be a very important thing, you know. Uh, one of the things I think uh, COVID has made clear is, uh, you know, we call grocery workers uh, essential workers. Um, and we've learned how essential they are. We don't pay them like they're essential. And one of the things we're going to have to learn is how to actually value people monetarily and otherwise uh, as essential workers. And I think that is uh, very, very important. Um, it's exactly these workers that don't have uh, paid sick days, uh, don't, often don't have health insurance uh, at minimum wage uh, or maybe a hair over it. Uh, you know, these are structural changes we have to introduce into our society. And my hope is that COVID will be a uh, starting point for developing those structural changes. Yeah, so Machiavelli is definitely cited as saying, never waste the opportunity offered by a good crisis. So imagine sort of um, a governor or a president was supposed to be inaugurated tomorrow. What policies sort of could change some of the structure? I know we've discussed some of them, but I'd love to uh, go further. Well, I think I, what I, else should so this be I, opening? Yeah, I think it's really important to have what I, I think of as a sort of family friendly policy um, or family enhancing policy. Um, and I do think that it's very likely at the other end of COVID where we're gonna get a push in this direction because one of the things that I think COVID has made clear is how insecure and uncertain people feel because of it. And I think if one of the natural reactions is gonna be a, a move towards security, that people want security. 
So I think, you know, first, obviously, is universal health insurance. You've got 40 million plus people who are uh, becoming uh, filed for unemployment. Uh, you've got 30 million workers at least and probably more who lose employer sponsored insurance. And when you count in their dependents, you're up in the 70 million range. Now, a lot of them will be tied over for a little bit by unemployment insurance um, and uh, access to the exchanges and things. Nonetheless, we're gonna have millions of people without insurance and then millions of people who are on Medicaid and in certainly the 14 states that don't have, haven't expanded Medicaid, um, they won't have access to Medicaid. Interestingly, um, you know, I think one of the problems that has uh, really become obvious is that when we passed the Affordable Care Act, we thought, all right, now we've got a path to universal coverage. We may not make it beyond 96%, but we got a path to universal coverage. What's become enormously clear is with the 14 implacable states, uh, Texas, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, um, there's no path to universal coverage. You cannot get to universal coverage if we keep the system the same as it is. So if we really want universal coverage, we're gonna have to actually change the structure of the financing system and probably change Medicaid. Um, second, we do need a unemployment insurance system which covers people for need, not people uh, for some finite amount of time and at 50% pay, um, you know, paying uh, uh, industries to keep people working um, is a very important thing we need to, to really innovate. And again, I think taking it away from states is probably really important. There's no reason that if someone's unemployed in Florida, they should get 12 weeks of compensation, but if they're unemployed in New York, they get, you know, whatever, 36 weeks. I don't know what it is in New York, but um, that just seems totally unacceptable in the country. There's all the contract workers, gig workers, self-employed people that should also have access to unemployment insurance. There's family leave. Again, critical to families. Just a mountain of data now about how important the early uh, months and years are for child development. Um, having parental leave uh, or uh, the ability to take leave to care for a relative in a severe illness, very important, should not be left at the states. We should, you know, fortunately, the federal government for federal workers has now passed it. That I think will be the floor, um, but we, we need to have that. Um, it's not great at the federal level. It's three months, uh, but it's a step in the right direction. Um, I, so I think those are places to start. Um, and I think there uh, uh, probably need some other items uh, along the way, but I think that would be a very good package to begin with. I think the other piece that we had discussed about sort of family enhancing policy is um, universal daycare or pre-K. We're realizing, yeah. yeah, that trying to work at home while you also have your kids at home is incredibly difficult and people had before been able to escape to the office and not really notice that and now we're beginning to see that perhaps that's not as feasible yeah um i want to uh, circle go ahead no i totally agree with you i would say that you know one, one of my pet peeves is the single best in investment any government can make is um uh child uh, nurse family partnerships for children in mm -hmm. poverty where you send a nurse or you send someone trained to help new mothers um, with kids in poverty. Kids in poverty are born into very stressful situations. Um, and we know that if we invest in the first year or two with these uh, nurse family partnerships, helping mothers learn how to be better, uh, or parents, but mainly mothers, um, learn how to be pa better parents, um, uh, pays huge dividends in terms of reduced healthcare complications, redu uh, better school performance, reduced criminal justice, and longer term uh, pay increases, uh, i.e. people learn skills and have better jobs. Uh, so, you know, you get seven to $15 return for every dollar invested, and you actually make the money back pretty fast within five years. So it becomes a huge uh, you know, investment uh, that really returns and, you know, any venture capitalist would love it. Um, and we should be doing that. Right. Yeah. And, and there have been several randomized control trials um, looking at exactly the nurse family partnership. Right. Um, also, also showing that there's a well, increased parental involvement from uh, father's side. So that's 
Yep. Great. And I, I shoved a little, I took a little of the savings we had in the ACA and shoved it into doing nurse family partnership demos, but we didn't make it standard in the Affordable Care Act, unfortunately. I want to circle back to what you were saying about um, sort of health insurance, uh, that COVID is clearly impacting every element of the medical system from drug approval processes to hospital balance sheets and insurance and CDC communication. How do you see COVID changing the medical system for better and for worse? Well, I think it's, it's uh, undeniably the move to telemedicine is here to stay, gonna stay, we're not going back. Um, and I think we need to figure out how to finance that in a smarter way. Um, we all benefit from it, uh, physicians, uh, patients who have chronic illness who need more attention and in-person visits would benefit uh, from it. So I think that's definitely true. Um, we're working with a lot of insurers to try to get them to shift how they're paying, not just for primary care visits, but also hospitals. One of the things that's become quite clear is that hospitals are quote unquote losing money um, because they're not doing elective procedures like hip and knee surgery, uh, um, uh, spine surgery, and uh, a variety of other things. Um, that is terrible that that's how they make their money on elective procedures. We need to rejigger our compensation and reimbursement system completely so that hospitals make money on doing what's more necessary and the elective stuff is uh, uh, not so heavily incentivized since a lot of the elective stuff is not either marginally necessary or not necessary. A lot of it is low value care, um, but we should not make it how they make their profits and margins. Um, and so we've been working with a lot of payers to try to get them to rethink uh, their payment scheme uh, for this. Uh, I think you will get the, a big change. I would say one other thing which seems to be quite clear is the um, use of the healthcare system has dropped dramatically, even in places where COVID isn't prevalent. Um, so I think you may find out that a lot of people are like, mm, maybe I don't need to go to the doctor for that. Maybe it's a good thing I don't go to the doctor or you know, not going to the doctor and giving my back a rest, you know, it improves it and I don't need surgery, I don't need injections. And so I think the, uh, a lot of pay insurers are worried that there'll be a huge upsurge in going to the doctor. I'm a little more skeptical. I think actually a lot of people may be hesitant about going to the doctor and may, or may have found ways that they don't need to uh, use the healthcare system so much. And we may see a decrease in healthcare spending. Um, I think uh, uh, a lot of these changes, we could revert back without some more important structural changes. Um, we need to change how we pay um, and that'll provide a platform for changing how much care is delivered and the kind of care that's being delivered to people. The last thing I would say is that one of the biggest um, outcomes of this whole thing is gonna be a big need for mental health care. Um, and, uh, no country, and I've just finished a book on uh, looking at 11 or 10 other countries in the US, um, and I can confidently say no country has a very good way of addressing mental health care problems. It might strike a lot of people uh, listening to this that um, the United States is probably more innovative in trying new models. Over the last decade, maybe a little bit more, we've seen how important it is to address mental health issues. Um, it's harder to put in, in, in place the infrastructure to do that, but we have experimented with uh, telemental health services and a variety of other things. We're actually on the cutting edge as far as countries go in the United States. And I think the COVID epidemic has uh, turbocharged telemental health uh, and also made people understand that we have to integrate mental health into routine primary care and specialty care much more. I think you'll see a big shift in that direction um, a big demand for it by the patients and a big shift in that direction uh, going forward. Uh, so I'm uh, pretty, that, that's one area we will actually, COVID has actually pushed the change and that change will become uh, more institutionalized in the healthcare system. One of the things that strikes me is very different about the mental, mental health situation now versus sort of in World War II where um, in London, they were very concerned that during the blitz, everybody was going to go completely berserk, um, whereas you actually really didn't see that. And one of the um, theories put forth by Sebastian Younger in his book, Tribe, is that 
um, and during the blitz, it was sort of everyone's in this together. Now, clearly COVID is, um, we're all in it together, but we're all really being, having a sort of enforced social distancing. Do you think that that um, means that there's sort of greater mental strain than there was, say, even during World War II, during extreme circumstances like the blitz? Yes, sorry, I was, that was trying to kill my phone so it wouldn't disrupt us. Yes, um, the fact that we have a president who uh, governs by divisiveness and breaking us apart rather than unifying it um, uh, does not help this circumstance. Second, it is the pro problem that's uh, a lot of what you got during the blitz is that people were sharing, uh, you know, uh, Winston Churchill was famous for taking the underground in London to work. Um, that creates a kind of, you know, coherence and, and people in it together feel when your prime minister is, you know, in the car, in the, in the subway car with you. Um, we don't have that uh, in the society and physical distancing makes it hard. We could have had a unifying message and a we're all in it together and we're all gonna work. We have glimpses of it, that sort of banging of the pots and pans at seven o'clock for healthcare workers is a glimpse of it. Uh, unfortunately, I think uh, uh, the fact that we have not had a consistent message from our leaders of encouraging that uni unity uh, makes it a problem and does mean that each individual is suffering their mental health problem together. I mean, this sort of meant, you know, being in it, being in it with other people. Um, uh, there are lots of experiments that show it, not just during the blitz, you know, um, uh, West Point uh, uh, students are the same thing. When they go through the most grueling part, uh, they're all in it together. And when they do finals, it's each competing against the others. Way more stress around finals than there is in, you know, live ammunition uh, demos because they're all in it together. And so that's a really important thing. And one of the reasons I have a feeling that we've had so much mental stress over the last, uh, certainly the last four years and maybe whole decade is the fact that we haven't felt like we're all in it together as a country. So I guess there's sort of two questions that that leads to. One is how do we create that unity? And then the other sort of getting back to the piece that we had discussed about policy changes is there's some fairly good political economy research that um, when people feel more unified that they're much more willing to support um, a broad welfare state. Um, part of the reason why we see much broader welfare states in Scandinavia than say in melting pot America. Um, to what extent do you think that the current divisiveness is actually going to be a huge barrier to the policy changes that we discussed before, like uh, universal pre-K or universal health care? Well, if you listen to those people who think that there are 80 year cycles in American politics and we're about to enter another wave and Trump is the last gasp of uh, the divisive uh, us versus them uh, Republican approach, uh, yes, maybe, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard to know if we have a landslide um, uh, and a transformational administration coming after this um, that does demonstrate the right kind of leadership. Uh, you know, it's not something in this circumstance we're going to do ourselves. It's something we need leaders uh, who can uh, help the country do that. And that can only happen if we have uh, an election that definitively rejects the divisiveness and embraces an us uh, uh, motto um, and ethos. Um, you know, that's where we're at. And uh, I do think, um, the, as I said, I don't think the country left to our own devices that will not work. That has to have uh, a leader that can help us envision um, parenthetically, and you'll see the connection. It will seem weird. Um, I was uh, sent, I'm talking to a Jewish audience. I was sent a uh, uh, something which were counted that, you know, all the great Christmas songs that we know, uh, uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, I think, and White Christmas and all that written by Jews. Um, but also uh, um, uh, Over the Rainbow uh, from uh, Wizard of Oz, uh, written by Jews. And there's a line in that when I was reading this, uh, you know, uh, Frank Jewish propaganda um, that just reminded me uh, of something that I do think is really important um, that we've completely lost sight of. 
um, uh, which is, you know, the power of dreaming in America, of imagining uh, uh, w the kind of country we want. Um, right now, we have this sort of, uh, you know, nostalgia. Um, I think America's at its greatest, and we come together when we have a common dream uh, and vision. And I do think uh, uh, Democrats have been particularly poor at articulating that dream. Um, and I do think we need to uh, be able to articulate for people the kind of uh, future we want. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's got its elements are, I, I can say, you know, what has America always stood for? Individual freedom built on a basis of decent living for the vast majority of people. Decent, not, you know, the, the, the streets are paved with gold. We all don't get gold, but we get decent. You know, it was the great middle-class country, even uh, in the revolution when people didn't have that much, it was a step up from Europe. And that decency, decent living and individual freedom is what is characterized the United States. How you put that into the right vision uh, is what's going to be critical for uh, a leader who's going to unify the country uh, in the next phase. Um, but that, I think that's the pivotal place we have to go. And you think the decency is sort of more important than the mobility? Um, I think decency, uh, the ability for everyone to have decency and to get to decency is critical. I think that is hmm. what, um, you know, we have more than enough money to raise the bottom up to decent. Uh, it's it's ridiculous. I mean, we have twenty two trillion dollar GDP a year, fifty five thousand per person. This is not a problem of money. This is a problem of distribution, and uh, uh, it's not, and it's not even that big a problem of distribution. Uh, so, you know, the good thing is, I have to say, the good thing is, we've gotten used to writing trillion dollar checks without looking at the at the balance, you know, at our bank statement. Um, and hopefully that'll carry over just a little bit more into the next uh, uh, administration so we can write a few more two, bill two trillion dollar checks and uh, rejigger this healthcare system, unemployment insurance, family leave policy. I want to just- I had one, If I had one complaint, if I had one complaint about the current Congress, as much as I love uh, Nancy Pelosi's leadership, uh, a lot of the legislations we've passed have not been structural changes. They've been stopgap. And I think that's a bad mistake. I think we need structural changes, not stopgap. So we're just going to quickly think of your position as provost at Penn. Um, how do you think higher education is going to <laughs> shift? Fucked. Oh, excuse me. Um, it's a bad time uh, higher for higher education. So we're going to have a lot of colleges closing. Um, and because of the financial stress, uh, the cost of bringing students back is going to be enormous because you're going to have to go into singles. Um, uh, classrooms are going to be divided. Uh, let me just remind what I people what I said at the start. We have uh, you know crowded spaces, uh, uh, which close enclosed spaces for a long period of time. It sounds my like my lecture uh, at Penn. Uh, so, you know, at Penn, I think we're looking at um, uh, no more than 25 kids in a classroom. All right, I get 150 kids for my class. You know, that means you can show up in class with me every six day. That's not a really good formula. We're gonna have to convert all the dorm rooms to singles. Not a really great formula for, you know, rich places like Harvard and Penn, they're gonna be able to weather it, but others aren't. Um, we, like many places, have put a hiring freeze. Ours is a little lukewarm. It's less than a freeze. But at the entry level, we'll have very, very little hiring. Um, and that's terrible for post for uh, uh, PhD students. Um, and uh, we're, as a consequence, cutting back on our graduate programs because we're not imagining lots of jobs. I think, you know, if we were a smart institution and smart institutions would do this, but I haven't seen one institution that's made this declaration and showed that it's smart, you would create a pool of five, $10 million and say, we're going out there and we're just hiring the absolute best PhD candidates in the country. And we're gonna hire at $100,000 each, we're gonna hire, call it 75 of them or a hundred of them, because we're gonna get the absolute best and transform our institution that way. That's what I would do if I were a college president. I'm merely the vice provost. 
Well, with that, I think we will turn it over to audience questions. Great, thank you so much. Uh, just a reminder, if you have a question, there's a Q&A section at the bottom, you can type those in. Uh, we will then promote you to a panelist. You can come on with your video and audio and ask the questions. Don't submit questions uh, anonymously because we're only gonna choose you if we know who you are. Uh, we're gonna begin with uh, Rabbi Danny Nevins. Uh, Danny is a Harvard alum, a dean of um, JTS Rabbinical School, a good friend of my family's. Uh, and Danny also was one of the first people I knew who had coronavirus and was very public about that. Uh, so Danny, go ahead and ask your question. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really a pleasure to hear you speaking, both of you, father and daughter, uh, in such an office. Um, Dr. Emanuel, you've written quite a bit about triage, and uh, in the article that you published in the New England Journal in, in March with a number of co-authors, you spoke about different ethical systems, some of which were more utilitarian in nature and some of which were more egalitarian or um, justice-based. And you said that in general, you know, you, you can balance them in different ways, but in a pandemic, you really have to give priority to saving the maximum number of lives. And I want to sort of question that a little bit and, and say that- um, I'm not sure that's what I said, but that's okay. okay. <laughs> All right, well, that was my reading of, of, of that part of the article, which okay. just uh, full disclosure, I write on bioethics from a Jewish perspective and published a, a response on uh, triage. Well, my concern is that by giving priority to utilitarianism, there are vulnerable populations like people living with disability and communities, people of color, like as you mentioned, who are um, especially badly affected by uh, this, that might be allotted fewer resources because they're not as you know, good a bet um, in the allocation of scarce medical resources. So I'm curious, is it possible to retain a justice basis or an egalitarian basis um, to the allocation of scarce resources um, even when there's so much pressure to use a utilitarian perspective? First of all, I'm not a utilitarian. Let me be clear. Second of all, uh, even uh, I do object to the notion that utilitarians aren't just. They have a conception of justice. You may not agree to it, but it's certainly a conception of fairness and justice, and it can't be easily dismissed. Um, there is something about saving the most people in an emergency that is appealing to everyone everywhere. Um, and I don't think you got to be a utilitarian to think that's the right answer uh, uh, in an emergency kind of situation. Uh, firemen run into a house and just try to save as many people as possible. That doesn't seem to me to be an unethical uh, or an unfair approach. They don't go, what's your disability? Let me uh, assess all of this. They just save as many people as they can. Um, I think our position, uh, first of all, is not utilitarian. We do think that it's important to maximize uh, life years, not lives. Um, I am not a, I'm famous uh, or infamous, uh, uh, thanks to Sarah Palin, for talking about life years uh, as a more important criteria than lives. Um, and I do think that there's, uh, it fits with a lot of people's intuition. Um, and the main reason is a non-utilitarian reason. It's not because you know younger people are more productive and gonna have more employment. I think we want people to live through life's, uh, a complete life. We call it the complete life system from childhood to adolescence, to young adulthood, to middle age, to older age. Living a complete life is what we find val valuable and what we wanna promote and uh, uh, that's what we should try to, uh, if you will, maximize or ensure that everyone can do it. And I don't think that uh, there's no racial tinge to it. There's no, you know, most people with disabilities uh, don't have a short and foreshortened lifespan. Um, and so I think that's what I would defend. And I think that's the right intuition. And I've done a lot of uh, informal surveying on this and even formal surveying on this most people uh, agree with that view. Um, they don't think, and for technical reasons, they don't think saving infants is more important than saving 20 year olds. Saving 20 year olds is the sweet spot, uh, roughly speaking. And I think that's the right answer actually um, uh, for a variety of, of reasons. Um, I don't think uh, 
uh, if you have to ration in the midst of a pandemic, ICU beds or ventilators or uh, medication, if we got a medication, that uh, that's the moment where you redress these inequities and you say, oh, you're a minority uh, with uh, comorbidity, society's done you a bad turn, you get priority. That just sounds unethical uh, on the face of it. As I said at the start, we have to rectify and you're not gonna rectify the inequities of our society in the midst of a pandemic. Um, and you aren't going to, and by the way, I never said, and I don't know where the implication was, oh, if you've got comorbidities, we're not saving you. Um, when you look at an intervention in rationing, if someone's gonna die, uh, even with the intervention, that seems like a waste of resources to give it to them. If someone's gonna live even without the intervention, it seems like a waste of resources to give them an intervention. You wanna look at people for whom the intervention will change their prognosis. That's who you want to get. Um, it has nothing to do with your comorbidity. It has nothing to do with your disability. Um, so that's the way I think about this uh, rationing absolutely scarce resources. And remember, if you're gonna give it to one person, someone else is gonna die and not get it. That's what it means to ration in these kind of circumstances. And so you would have to justify your position to the person who didn't get it. And I think that's very hard where they're losing the most important thing they have. Uh, Danny, thank you for that provocative question. Uh, we're going to move to uh, Jody Duche, uh, who is uh, an alum of Harvard Medical School and works at Beth Israel and also the mother to three incredible daughters, uh, two who have graduated from Harvard and one who is currently a student there. So um, <laughs> Jody, please go ahead. Here we go. The camera's on. The video is not working. Oh. Hi, yeah, I'm not sorry, hearing you. our video is not working, but um, I have a question about whether you think the healthcare system or how you can envision the healthcare system handling another surge of cases um, in the fall or if we open up prematurely, not only from a um, like, sort of logistically, but from a mental health standpoint in particular, do you think you can call on the same frontline workers again and again? And do you, or like, what do you envision? Well, I, uh, two separate questions. One is one of facilities and capacity. I think we've gotten a lot better about the capacity and facilities. Um, for example, learning that we probably don't need those ventilators and they're probably not a good thing to be using. Um, I think we're gonna, we seem to be continuously learning about how to improve our care. I think one of the issues is we're only three months into this. Just look at how much we've learned already, both from a genome standpoint, from what works and what doesn't work standpoint, from how important uh, PPE is in, uh, to reduce infections to frontline workers. So I think the stress level is gonna go down in managing it. I am worried and I'm very public about predicting, I think October, November, we're gonna have another second wave. We're probably going down, although that's clearly not true in all parts of the country because more activities are out of doors a lot harder to spread this thing out of doors. So summer will get a reprieve, whether the heat plays any role, who knows, but I think just the out of doorsness is gonna play a role. What I'm worried about is that people get a little lax and then we move indoors in October and November and uh, all of that stuff that I talked about, crowding, closed spaces, being with people for a long period of time, gonna come back in a big way and that's when you're going to have a surge. And I think your worry about the mental health and burnout of frontline workers is very real. Um, I do hope this summer break, we now have a underutilization of the healthcare system, uh, as far as anyone can tell. And maybe the summer break and the relaxation and maybe the rejiggering of processes of care will uh, enable us to get through. But I think your worry is non-trivial, that you can't keep pounding on the same front hop frontline healthcare workers over and over again um, and put them under huge amounts of stress uh, without uh, it taking a toll on their ability to perform well. Thank you. Thank you for that question. We're going to go now to Charles uh, Mills, who's an alum. Uh, Charles, go ahead and ask your question. First off, Dr. Emanuel, it's really a pleasure to get to talk to you directly. I read a lot of your stuff. I'm a physician in palliative medicine. Oh, we just lost you. I'm We'll get that back. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to go to uh, Kathleen Lane, 
uh, who is my dear colleague uh, at Harvard Hillel. Kathy, go ahead and ask your question. Hi. Um, do you see a future where we could have two types of hospitals in um, like heavily populated areas? One being the hospital, obviously, that we have today, and one just for future viruses or biological attacks or anything like that? No. Because okay. the second would be a huge infrastructure waste. And uh, it would jack up prices a lot uh, to keep it operating without, I think, uh, necessary. Um, I've, I've, I, I hope there are no hospital administrators listening. I've been anti-hospital. I mean, you, we need hospitals, but we don't need so many of them. A lot of what we do in hospitals, we can do outside of hospitals. And we should, uh, I mean, we've had a very, very long, long-term decline in the use of hospitals on a per capita basis. Um, 1981 was the high point in terms of utilization of hospitals, and we need to do much more at home, uh, much more where people, and uh, fortunately, um, we've got a lot of technology that has enabled that, and we just need to make use of it much, much more. And I think uh, using hospitals less and using home more is probably a really good uh, trade-off financially from patient satisfaction, almost every way you can think of it. All right, Charles, you're back. Yeah, sorry about that, Charles. Uh, go ahead. That, I, like I guess they didn't the, like the question you were going to ask. No, so. no, they cut me off. I, I, knew, I knew of the game. Uh, I'm a paleo physician in New Hampshire. We actually used your New England Journal article in terms of an allocation procedure for our hospital. So I appreciate that very much. Two Thank quick you. questions. One, your article in The Atlantic from 2014. As you look back on that now in your lifespan here, what you, your contributions this year, do you have any thoughts of resetting some of that goal of 75? And the second no. Thing, okay. And the second thing, that's a good answer. The second thing is that in the context of uh, healthcare financing, you talked about the uh, financial model changing, particularly rel relative to hospitals. Uh, I think something else that's been overtly demonstrated by all this is nursing homes. Long-term care, yeah. elderly yeah. care is, is we were screwed up. And I work, a lot of my palliative work is in nursing homes and the disaster that this has caused simply because the model of distribution has been awful. What is your suggestion? All right, to, so the, the, I haven't rethought the 75. And, and the reason is, um, what, what does it take to li live a full good life? Uh, takes meaningful relationships, meaningful work, and meaningful uh, uh, extracurricular activities like religious affiliation, a vocational interest you're passionate about, um, and the problem is, you know, if you just look at life, uh, we have, uh, you know, at 75, Alzheimer's goes chugging along and then, whoo, way up uh, to roughly a third of the population. If you look at mental agility, um, you know, loss of memory, loss of working memory, uh, your plasticity and ab ability to be think creatively, your ability to stay on, on task and focus, all of that really declines. Um, and uh, uh, so, um, yes, I, you know, God willing, I'll be cognizant and, and be able to continue uh, working, et cetera. If I'm an outlier, and I can tell you there are outliers. You know, if you look at Tony Fauci, he's 79 years old. Right. The man is clearly an outlier in the positive sense. Um, I knew Ken Arrow, famous economist, uh, towards the end of his life, he was 90. Let me tell you, you know, if I had a tenth of the brain power at the, my peak that he had at 90, you know, it would be amazing. Um, I, I think you're uh, doing pretty well. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I, I think, look, let's face it, it's a bell-shaped curve. Most of us aren't going to be those positive outliers. Most of us are going to be in the big middle. I I'm, expect I'll be in the big middle. Um, and that's why I don't change my mind. Nursing homes, you're going to see, I, I think the nursing home model is dead. Dead, dead, dead. Who's going back to a nursing home? Right. You know, you, you, you only put the mother-in-law you hate in a nursing home. I mean, it's just not going to be. Um, and so what you are going to see is um, a shift to uh, aging in place. And we're going to have to reconfigure. And I think this is what you were hinting at. How do to the extent that the government is the biggest payer through Medicaid for nursing homes, how does the government transform that payment, not to support institutional care, but the same kind of payment to support uh, aging in place at home? Um, uh, 
the worry about that is it does put a burden on the family. Uh, but I think uh, given the COVID situation and everything else that has been exposed, I think nursing home industry is a goner. Um, and I think, it, you know, uh, you're going to see old people resist going into nursing home or they'll just be places for people who are uh, very severely cognitively impaired. I just don't see it um, as a long-term model. Um, but you got to change the financing at the government level. And That's the right. main hesitation about changing that financing, as you well know, has been you change the financing and, you know, the government just, just writes these enormous hundred billion, billion dollar checks, which it can't suppose, supposedly can't afford. So it has to figure out a way that will support aging in place without the, uh, you know, everyone taking advantage of it and a super enormous cost. So we have to figure out how to tread that line. Which, which comes uh, sociologically, that's a hard thing because I think as a society, we have a model that we are accustomed to and the nursing home model is our disposition of what we do with older people when they're physically impaired and, and again, the bulk of people in nursing homes do have cognitive issues already. That's yeah. one of the major drivers. So when you're looking at a 60, 70% population shift of cognitive issues, those folks are hard, uh, are harder to manage at home. So it's-, it's I to I Look, I totally agree with you. It's one of the reasons I'm not a big fan of, let's push life expectancy to 84. We know what happens at 84. You know, that curve on Alzheimer's going straight up to the ceiling, that's what happens. Right. Charles, thank you. thank you so much for your question. Uh, we're going to go now to uh, David. Uh, is it Ryson or Reeson, who's a, a Harvard alum? It's Ryson. Ryson, go ahead. Nice to be you. Um, I, uh, I'm not sure that I'm on. I guess I am on. Yes, you are on. We can hear you perfectly. Good. Um, I'd like to ask you, given the long tradition in medicine um, of the laying on of hands, I wonder whether you could talk to any possible disadvantages you see in the growth of telemedicine. Oh, I, I, look, I think personal, interpersonal relationship in medicine is absolutely important, uh, vital. Absolutely, I totally agree with you. So what's the role for telemedicine? The worried well. Um, there are lots of people who want a quick answer uh, and, you know, they can be managed well without actually being seen in the laying on of hands. And we need to focus the laying on of hands on people who actually need it, the people with, co with uh, chronic illness. And that, I, so my hope is the worried well, uh, um, you could have you know, telemedicine, you could have for mothers and their new children, uh, nurses visiting the house, nurse practitioners visiting the house, um, so that they don't have to come into the pediatrician's office. I mean, what do you do with a newborn all the way, you know, are they on the growth curve? Are they developmentally all right? And take this immun immunization. That's all you're really doing. That could be handled by a nurse practitioner going to the house rather than bringing them into the office. So you can focus attention on people with chronic illness. And I think that is but that's where, that's what the trade-off is. So you would spend, instead of 15, 20 minutes with someone who's got three chronic illnesses, you know, congestive heart failure, COPD, and diabetes, you can spend 40 or 45 minutes with them. So I, that's the trade-off I want us to get to. And I think telemedicine has an absolutely vital role in freeing up that time. What about uh, in mental health services? Can you speak to the advantages and disadvantages of telemedicine apropos of mental health services? Uh, so truth in advertising, I work with a venture fund and a, a venture fund, we have an investment in uh, some of those telemental health facilities. I don't think there's a way that we're gonna solve the mental health problem without telemental health and telemental health you know, at least without great studies, the outcomes seem to be uh, uh, for some populations who prefer telemedicine uh, better or just as good as in person. So I think, again, depends upon the person, the patient mix, but I think there's a critical role for telemental health. You remember that a lot of people who have agoraphobia, who don't want to come out, don't want to go. I mean, there's a big problem with that. People who have anxiety disorder, um, treating them over uh, uh, tele-mental health could be very beneficial. Sure. David, thank you for your, uh, your question. Uh, we're going to go to our final question for the evening. Uh, Nancy Beth Shear, an alumna of Radcliffe. 
Uh, Nancy, we're going to unmute you and go ahead and ask your question. I was wondering when you personally will begin to go outside and resume normal social activities and whether it will require a widely available vaccine and what will you advise your family? Well, it depends what you mean by normal, okay? <laughs> well, I, I think that's really important, uh, those quotation marks. So here's what I do and, you know, um, uh, tell my daughter, you know, do what I say, not what I do. But here's what I do, right? So we go out and we bike and we run and we have go into the park and uh, uh, do that. We wear masks and go shopping uh, for food, pharmacy, um, and uh, I guess that's about it. <laughs> um, uh, we, I will not go to restaurants. Um, I will order in from restaurants and I want to keep them all alive so that when we do have a vaccine, we can all, they will be there. Um, but I don't think, uh, I mean, I've seen the eating outside and I'm not 100% sure I like it. Uh, it's still too crowded for my liking. Uh, interacting with a, uh, you stay there for a prolonged period of time. I certainly wouldn't go to a restaurant indoors. Um, but as I said, we, uh, we have friends over uh, out on our back deck uh, where we can be suitably distanced and we bring in food from a restaurant so none of us are cooking for it and it's packaged up. Um, and that's the, that's the kind of interaction that I, I don't go to synagogue. Um, my synagogue doesn't meet, but if it did, I wouldn't go because I think that's a mistake. Um, so I think that's the, that's my normal life. I also have been asked repeatedly about flying and I'm not flying and I won't fly. Uh, I think it's a bad idea. Um, while the filtration system is good, we have a lot of good data that, you know, if someone has influenza two rows in front of you or two rows behind you, you're gonna, you know, you're a good shot if you got a three or four hour trip of getting it even uh, with a good filtration system because you're in close proximity for an extended period of time. So I think that's my when thumb. Will that behavior, when will you go beyond those behaviors and feel comfortable? Will it take a vaccine? Or, yeah. Yes. I'm not, so, so you know, I'll t I, ha I have, you know, besides my grandchildren, um, I, I have two big priorities or things that I get a lot of pleasure out of in my life. Uh, one is, eating at restaurants, and the other is uh, traveling and biking in diff distant countries or taking uh, periods where I go and write in other countries. I am not doing the writing in other countries. Uh, I can't imagine doing it uh, um, before a vaccine. Partially getting there is the whole problem. Um, and uh, just giving you my whole big spiel about restaurants. Um, so I, uh, I think normal is, I don't, uh, if you want to minimize your chance of getting this thing before a vaccine, I think you got to take seriously how it's transmitted, you know, being around other people where spontaneous coughing, uh, sneezing, singing, yelling, those are where you, you're going to get it. Um, so uh, could I imagine someone would say to me, I'd go to a restaurant because uh, sitting outdoors, et cetera. Maybe if they're really good at adhering to, to uh, six feet distance, et cetera. But why risk it? I got a back deck and I, I'm rather use the back deck and be safe. Nancy, Beth, thank you for that question. Uh, we're out of time. I have one quick question that someone has written in. I think many of us would be eager to hear, which is any thoughts or ideas for high holidays and how we might be able to uh, somehow congregate? Well, I, I, so I'll say the following. Um, I was dreading Pesach dreading Pesach um, and, um, uh, you know, what is it to do it alone? And, you know, I have a partner who uh, uh, isn't Jewish. She participates with me, but, um, and so I was really dreading it. We signed on for, uh, in Washington, D.C., for Six and I's uh, online Pesach. Um, uh, it was wonderful. It wasn't everything I wanted, but no Pesach is everything I wanted, but it was pretty wonderful. And I was surprised how meaningful it actually was. 
uh, I got to know some other people who there's no chance in the tradition I would have met in a small group of, you know, I think we had seven or eight people. Um, and so I think we're going to have to think of, I will not go to high holiday services. Uh, we won't have a vaccine by holiday services. And it's especially Yom Kippur all day together. It would be a horrible talk about super spreading events to all the mishpacha that we care about and love. It would be a disaster. Even, so, even for minions outdoors? Minions outdoor, you'd have to separate a lot of people and keep the singing down or absent. I mean, and I'm being really serious. Uh, singing is a very dangerous uh, thing. Especially when um, I'm singing. Uh, especially I, when it's, yeah. I've got a terrible voice, so. Uh, out of tune, like me. Um, that might work, but you'd need an enormous, maybe the Harvard football field uh, stadium, you could do it, maybe. Um, but I think that's the kind of distance you're going to need if you're going to have a thousand people. Um, it, it, I don't know. It makes me very, very, uh, I, I, as my nice daughter will tell you, I take a lot of risks. I'm willing to tolerate a lot of risk in life. That makes me feel really uncomfortable. Uh, well, we thank you uh, for your wisdom, for your candor. Uh, we thank you, Natalia. Uh, for your great questions. It's wonderful to see you both also interacting with each other. We'll see if we can get that F-bomb uh, bleeped out, but I'm not sure. Uh, in the meantime, I want to wish you and all of our guests uh, uh, safety and health. Uh, we're returning back uh, together on June 10th with Mike Greenberg. We're heading in the sports direction from ESPN. Uh, and then on June 15th, we'll be having uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Stephen Breyer. So look in your email for those. We also want to hear from you and get some feedback. So we've put together a bit of a survey, which we'll be sending out, may already be in your inbox. Um, but until then, until next week, uh, take care. God bless. And Zeke, thank you so much. Natalia, thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I really appreciate it. One of my favorite and important uh, institutions in my life uh, we attended for uh, 17 years, I guess, yeah. on a regular Shabbat basis. You're, all, you're always welcome back, virtually or in person, whatever's safe. All right. Be well. Thank you all. Good all evening. Right. Stay safe.